to all of you for coming on a holiday weekend, no less, for those tuning in online. Some of you may be visiting today, and we welcome you. Perhaps somebody said, uh, you can come hang out with us this weekend, but you don't get fed unless you come to church. Um, and so I pray that you are blessed, nonetheless, both now and later with food. Children, you are able to head to Children's Church, so go and be merry. <laughs> For those who weren't here last week or didn't uh, sign up last week or wanted to think about it for a week, we do have another week uh, after service day where you can go and sign up physically for growth groups. Um, our leaders won't necessarily be out there, but the signs will be there and you can sign up um, to uh, uh, attend one of those. And then after this week, we'll be shifting to online registrations. So if you have additional questions, you can come talk to myself, talk to some of the growth group leaders, or call the office. Um, I'm not Pastor Dave. Don't, don't know if anybody noticed that. Um, Pastor Dave, I saw him. I thought, where is he? There he is, all the way over there. Um, he was rather ill this week, um, and so we have a, a, a shepherd who leads us bes beside still waters, and sometimes we need that because we will refuse to go unless we are forced to. Um, and so the shepherding team came along and said, Dave, you need to actually get better um, because he was trying so hard to amidst napping probably, I don't know, 12 hours a day or so to kick this fever, also trying to write a message for this weekend. And so I'm very thankful for the opportunity. You may not be. I'm really thankful for the opportunity to come up again and open the word. Um, but I'm also thankful that it, it wasn't necessarily going to be me. We have an incredible shepherding team filled with wonderful uh, preachers who love to bring the word and I'm really thankful that we have, the, have multiple people who can come alongside Dave or even myself um, because it's not important that it's me or that it's Dave up here opening the word. It's important that we're opening the word. And I'm really thankful to, to work at a church, to serve at a church, to worship in a church where that is our goal, is to open the word and see what God's truth says. So we're going to be back continuing our way through the Gospel of John. We're jumping back into our series, Life in His Name. And if you recall, because it's been a few weeks, there's a, a thesis statement that John makes in chapter 20 that should help us identify the entirety of what he is speaking on, what he is trying to do as he writes his gospel and what the Spirit of God is trying to do as John writes. And it says this in verse 31 of chapter 20. It says, These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So that's the goal. John is, John is seeking by the power of the Spirit and, and the words of God, speaking through his quill or pen or whatever they wrote with, to persuade you, to show you, to work and to allow the Spirit to work inside you, for the Spirit to enter inside you and convince you that Jesus is the Messiah. Everything he's writing is to show us this. And last time we met to talk about this, over a month ago, we saw, we looked at the, the story where Jesus healed a man who was born blind. He lifted the blindness from him. And it's on the heels of that passage that we're actually going to enter today's passage. For me, it's one of the most, for, it's one of my most well-known names, titles of Jesus. When I first became a believer, it was the one that I, I felt most seemed to exemplify the Jesus that I had heard about, that of the Good Shepherd. And so I'm going to be opening up to John chapter 10. If you have your Bible or want to grab a pew Bible, I welcome you to join me or swipe on your device to locate it. I'm going to start a few verses back. I'm actually going to start in, in chapter 9, starting right at verse 39, um, just to kind of give us a little bit of an on-ramp into this conversation that's happening today. So John chapter 9, verse 39. Jesus said, so the blind man, for context, has just been thrown out of the temple because he hasn't said what the Pharisees want him to say, which is that Jesus is a sinner. 
Okay, so he's been thrown out. The man finds Jesus, worships him. And Jesus says this, verse 39, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what? Are we blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Chapter 10, very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when the wolf is coming, right, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. The Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, uh, he is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind. Now, Jesus starts off this bit with an illustration. This illustration of a sheep pen and, and a shepherd who knows his sheep by name. And this, this imagery is a rebuke of the prideful and false teachings of the Pharisees. He, see, the Pharisees wanted people to follow their religion. They said, okay, if you want to get into this pen, this metaphorical pen, you have to follow us over the wall. And Jesus is calling them thieves and robbers. Thieves and robbers. They don't care for the flock. They want their way to be the right way. They don't want to enter through the gate. Now, some background um, I know that not everybody here is, is familiar with Palestinian agrarian culture. I certainly wasn't. <laughs> but this is not foreign language to the Pharisees, because this is the culture they lived in. And in fact, all throughout Scripture, God is using this imagery of shepherding for his people. Jeremiah 3.15, uh, God says, I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will lead you with knowledge and understanding. The shepherding language harkens back as well to that of David, who is the great shepherd king. This type of um, prefigure, if you will, of who Christ was going to be. In the book of Ezekiel, God condemns the failure of the people to shepherd his flock well. And he says this in verse 23, uh, uh, Ezekiel 34, verse 23. He says, I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. But here's the deal. David was already long dead and gone. So he's not referring to David, the, the person, the, the, the king that we saw. He's referring to the future David, the coming David. He's referring to Jesus. 
And he was judging the shepherds over Israel in this moment. He was contrasting them to how God declares his own shepherding to be. We see in verses 2 and 3 of that chapter of Ezekiel, he says, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to you, shepherds of Israel, who only take care of yourselves. Sound like anyone we know in the gospel. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, you clothe yourselves with the wool and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. Woe to you, shepherds. And then in verses 11 and 12, for this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. And here comes Jesus saying, this is me. This is me. And of course, no conversation on God's shepherding would be complete without that Psalm 23. So this language of shepherding is extremely well known to the Pharisees and to the Jewish people. And in this passage, Jesus is making two rather bold statements. He's making two more of his ground-shaking, earth-shattering, revelatory I am statements. He's had two of them previously. He said, I am the bread of life, or I am the living bread. Those are kind of considered one and the same. And he says, I am the light of the world. And here he says two more where he is declaring definitively his position, where he says, I am the gate, and he says, I am the good shepherd. Now, sheep pens in Israel were were mostly made of stone, like they would make stone walls, or they would use houses and and put a few boards in between them. They were made to be um, cordoned off areas, right? Private property. And so the walls, if they were stacked, would be stacked several feet high because sheep like to jump. And so it would be stacked a little high to try and keep the sheep from jumping over. And the shepherd would take them out during the day. They'd go grazing. They'd go roaming. They would eat. They would get, you know, sleepy because we all have that thing where after we eat, we get sleepy. And then they would bring them back at the end of the day. And they would bring them into this pen that was surrounded by these walls in order to keep them protected. And they would keep them safe from predators, from thieves, and they would close the gate. But there wasn't always a literal gate. Sometimes there was. Occasionally you'd have a door on hinges or some beams that could close. But a lot of times what you'd have is you'd have an entryway in the wall, and the shepherd would have to lay down in the entryway and function as the gate. He wouldn't get to close the door always and then go and curl up with a good book and fix the pillow and flip it over when it got too warm so he got to the cold side. The shepherd would have to stay out, protect the sheep, sometimes from themselves. And so when Jesus first provides this illustration, right, he speaks of himself as the shepherd, right? He's he's implying for them that he's the shepherd, right? The, The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep, right? The sheep listen to his voice. He calls the sheep by name because he knows them. But when he goes into expanding on this, he starts by saying, I am the gate. I am the gate. Jesus saying, I am the gate at this point is a slap in the face to the Pharisees. Because he then goes on to say, right, (laughs) all who have come before me are thieves and robbers. Thieves and robbers. Those who would try and enter the kingdom of God through unsavory means, unholy means, unrighteous means, ungodly means, you're thieves and robbers. That's who you are. And thieves come only to kill, steal, and destroy. They don't have good intent. So Jesus is saying, Pharisees, here's what you do. You come to kill, steal, and destroy. He's letting them know because he sees into the heart of man, right? He's letting them know what their intention is. He is is letting them know how malicious and ungodly they are. 
because the Pharisees aren't entering through them. They don't have an interest in entering through, through him. In fact, they, they frequently are trying to like break down that gate, right? They're trying to get rid of him. They're trying to, to um, eliminate him from the picture so that they can choose, so that they can tell people how they get into this sheep pen. Look back to that blind man who was healed, and you see the imagery of this, right? That man experienced an act of divine grace. He was healed of his blindness, and then he was expelled from the temple, the place that Jewish people believed they, were, they could go to experience the presence of God. He experienced it in the flesh, and then he was told by the religious leaders, those who were put in place to shepherd well, no, you're not welcome here anymore because you won't do what we want you to do. You won't climb this wall and tell us that Jesus is a sinner so that we have an excuse to do what we want to do. He responds to them with this cynical kind of wit, and they throw him out. The mark of, a, of thieves and robbers indeed. Now sometimes we also do this thing where we turn our faith into, you know, you could think of maybe like an obstacle course, right? Maybe a sheep pen is a little too, too outside of your realm of, of understanding, right? So we, we say that our path to our eternal positioning with the Lord, our, our path to paradise, to heaven, is by climbing over this wall, right? The wall of perfection. I have to make sure I'm good. I have to clean myself of my sin. The wall of penance. The wall of memorization or, or legalism. The, the wall of success. The wall of happiness. We say, until I climb this wall, I can't experience that paradise. All the while, Jesus is sitting over here saying, come through me. Come through me. In order to get to our place of safety, our place of salvation, we go through Jesus, not around him. We don't avoid him. We don't try and break him down. It doesn't work. And it's not what we're created to do. So often we think of heaven as this place that we can just attain to. But Jesus wants us to be with him. With him. He wants us to enter through him. There's one path and one way into life, and that's Jesus Christ, the gate. One path. One way. God made flesh, the Christ Messiah. All other ground is sinking sand. And in comparison to the Pharisees then and those who maybe are Pharisaical today, telling us that we need to jump through or telling ourselves that we need to jump through hoop after hoop and we have to read the right translation and we have to avoid this or we have to make sure we're doing that. In comparison to those who say, maybe if you don't give enough, you're not actually saved. Jesus is saying, come to me. That's where it starts. And Jesus is saying that not only that the way to life is through him, but as Jim said, that it's life to the full. Life to the full. Those who oppose and those who are opposed to Jesus' message want to steal, kill, and destroy you. Right? They want to just steal, kill, and destroy your spiritual health, your emotional health, your mental health. They want it all. But Jesus' yoke is easy and his burden is light, and he came that you might have life to the full. Are you going to walk through that gate or are you going to keep trying to go around? This doesn't mean that you're going to be wealthy. When it talks about life to the full, he's not saying you're going to be wealthy or he's not even saying that you're, you're going to be healthy, right? He's not, he's not saying by walking through this gate you're going to be cured of that diagnosis that's weighing on you or that you're going to find that job or that suddenly, poof, magically your marriage will be better. Your life is not made abundant, it's not made to the full in like the degree of existence, but in the kind of existence. And if you're confused about that, the Apostle Paul says it well when he says that he knows what it is to be in need. And he knows what it is to have plenty. And he says that the secret of being content is through him who gives us strength. You aren't guaranteed health and wealth. You are eventually in eternity. That healing will happen. Wealth abundant happens. 
but you're not guaranteed it right now. But you will have an abundant life when you enter the passage, the pastures of God through the gate of Jesus. And notice that that path matters. The way we get there matters. Because some people in, in society, and this has been around for a while, they, they believe that the ends justify the means, right? As long as I get where I'm supposed to go, everything else is fine. It doesn't matter who I run over, if I'm not lying, I'm not killing, I'm not as bad as that person over there. As long as I, I'm a good and moral person, we all end up in the same place. That's not what Scripture says. That's not what Jesus says. You're jumping the wall. You're saying, I want heaven without Jesus, but the point of heaven is Jesus. In fact, Jesus has a hard saying for you if you want to jump the wall, and he has a hard saying for those who might encourage you or tell you you should jump the wall. He says you're a thief and a robber. Because you're not called primarily, firstly, to a set of behaviors. You're called to a person. Believe in him, enter through him, and there you will find life abundant. The ends do not I'm just going to say it definitively. The ends do not justify the means. If you skip over the gate to climb the wall, you're not being clever. You're not being smarter than others, right? Work smarter, not harder. You're skipping the entire point of your created existence, which is communion with your great creator. That is the entire point. Jesus is providing this illustration to proclaim his position as the shepherd and the gate, which makes himself fully and primarily the meaning of life. Because as the gate, or, you could, or sometimes it's translated as the door into the sheep pen, Jesus is stating not only that he is the primary point of access, but also that he mediates access to the sheep. He's protecting them. He's guarding them. He's saying, you can't access, get access to my people unless I say so. Nobody else can care for the flock. Nobody else can manage it unless the shepherd says so. Because they know his voice. There's a world around us. Advertisers, politicians, social media influencers, sometimes pastors and churches, where they want you to follow them. Be my brand ambassador. Right? Allow me to influence you. And in a world where everybody is asking us to follow them, may we be the ones who follow Christ through the gate. Jesus is the gate. And so too is he the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. His fourth of the I am statements. And he compares the way a good shepherd acts with the action of a helping hand, right? A hired individual. Maybe some of you have experienced something at work where you've responded with something along the lines of like, not my circus, not my monkeys. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Above my pay grade. Mm-mm. I don't get paid enough. No thank you. That's the helping hand that Jesus is explaining here, Right? The, the helping hand is supposed to be there to help protect the flock, and they see a wolf and they run away. And oftentimes, even with our faith, that's us. How many of us, when people we know in the church run face first into our own sinful ways, or maybe into spiritual or demonic attacks, how many of us just run away? I'm not a pastor. I don't get paid to deal with this. Right? I've got my own stuff to deal with. I don't have time. This this thing that you're dealing with makes me uncomfortable. I don't know exactly what to say, so I'm just going to leave. The helping hands in their imperfection are the ones who run away when the predators are attacking. Too often that's us. 
when we're more interested in our own well-being than we are in uplifting and upholding the dignity of the image of God and the believers around us. But Jesus is the good shepherd. And the good shepherd, he says, lays down his life for the sheep. He loves them so much and he cares for them so deeply that when the wolf attacks, he lays down his very life for them. And he says this I am statement twice, which if you've been around church for a while, you know that the more often something is repeated, the more important it is, the more emphasis there is in it. And so he restates his position as the good shepherd in verse 14. And he says, I know my sheep and they know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. I want you to just meditate on that for a moment. He knows us and we can know him the way that the Father knows him and that he knows the Father. How many of you have a deep desire to be known that way? To be seen and loved despite your imperfections, despite the messiness. He knows you by name. What a mysterious and intimate level of knowledge, of care, of compassion. You don't learn the names of somebody that you either don't care about or that you don't hate, right? There's two extreme emotions that tend to lead us to learn people's names, right? We, we're interested in them or we are absolutely uninterested in them. Jesus is very, very interested in you. And he wants you to be interested in him. He desires that you would walk through the gate. He wants you to be a part of his sheep pen. Are you going to walk through that gate or are you going to keep trying to jump the wall? Whose voice do you want to follow? Do you want to follow the, the hired hand, the helping hand that runs away? Do you want to follow the advertiser? Do you want to follow the politician? Do you want to follow the social media influencer? Because they talk a good game. They have flashy things. Or do you want to follow the one who knows you like nobody else can and loves you? Perhaps today you're, you're here and you've, you, you've heard either today or, or other days the voice of Jesus calling to you, your shepherd calling you his own, and yet you turn away, you walk away, you give him the cold shoulder. All we like sheep, like sheep have gone astray, the word says. We goof up sometimes. That's why we need a shepherd, right? Sheep are, as Margie was saying, right? Sheep are, are kind of dumb. And we're kind of dumb. And the beautiful thing is that we have a shepherd who loves us so much that even in spite of that, he continues to lay down his life to, to bring us into his fold. Whose voice do you want to follow? Jesus doesn't say, and this is important, doesn't say that only the sheep who are in the pen already are his. See, our God is a missional God. The gospel is a global announcement. It's a global proclamation. For God so loved the world that whoever believes in him. Jesus says that he has other sheep that are not in this sheep pen currently, and he must go to get them. There's work to be done, and there are people that are, we have the opportunity to partner with him. There are people that, we, that God has asked us to speak to to love on, to care for, to pray for. How wonderful would it be for you to introduce somebody to the good shepherd who loves them? There are other sheep out there. Maybe they work in your office or they might work at your school or they go to your school. This isn't an age thing. You don't, you don't start doing this once you're, you know, 18 and out of the house. That's still when people move out of the house, right? It's 18. We have the opportunity to show people the incredible work of Christ, his protection, his care, his love, no matter our age. 
Maybe you have an opportunity to speak to somebody who frequents a coffee shop that you also frequent. There's work to be done. People who need to hear the voice of Jesus. And hear me, I'm not saying that we bring people to salvation. That's something that only the Lord can do. But we get an opportunity to partner with him. And honestly, are we excited about what God has done in our lives or not? Because when we're excited about something, we talk about it. We're getting into football season, and I'm already exhausted with how many people are talking about their, their favorite teams and how excited they are about their favorite teams. But how often do we talk about the good things that Jesus has done? And hear me, I'm not, I'm not even necessarily, I'm not, I'm not saying like you take the Bible and you run up to somebody and you do this with them until they believe in Jesus. I'm saying God has done work in your life and your testimony, your testimony isn't yours, it's God's. And it's what God is doing in your life. And if that's exciting to you, just share it with people. We're at a time in our society, in our culture, where people love sharing their stories. Share yours. People might be waiting to hear the sound of their shepherd's voice, and they might not even know that's who they're waiting for. And Jesus closes this section with a foreshadowing of the time to come, because see, shepherds, like good shepherds, not the good shepherd, but like shepherds who are good at what they do, right? They might defend their flock, right, against an attack. They might even be willing to endure bodily harm. But here's the deal. They have a whole bunch of sheep to care for, and if they lay down their life for every single sheep, they have now left all of the other sheep without any protection. So a good shepherd might lay down their life for a sheep. But the good shepherd, he does lay it down. It's not a question He alone, it says, has the full authority to do this. And he does it willingly. Jesus says, of my own accord, I do this. We remembered, we we recognized, we celebrated, we partook in communion at the start of the message because the proclamation that our good shepherd has laid down his life. And then he taking it back up again for our very souls. I love how Leon Morris talks about this idea. He says, a good shepherd does not characteristically give his life for the sheep. The good shepherd does. Moreover, the death of the Palestinian shepherd meant disaster for his sheep. The death of the good shepherd means life for his sheep. Which are you choosing today? Are you choosing death Are you choosing thievery and robbery, trying to climb over this wall? Or are you choosing life by entering through the gate? And how wondrous is it that, as Warren Wearsby commented when speaking on this passage, under the law of Moses, the sheep died for the shepherd, but under grace, the shepherd died for the sheep. Jesus is the gate. He's the only entrance into the place of reconciliation with God. He's the place of peace and security, our comfort and our solid ground. Jesus is the good shepherd, the owner of our very souls. And he knows each and every one of you by name. And he came, and while we were yet still sinners, he died for us. He laid down his life and took it back up again as only he had the authority to do by the command of the Father. And as we close out this passage, we see the Jewish listeners were divided once again. Have you noticed that theme as Jesus' ministry continues? This division that's happening in these Jewish listeners? First group said, he is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? And others countered this by saying, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of of the blind. See, the blind man was cast out of the temple by thieves and robbers, by the Pharisees. And he responded with worship. Lord, I believe, he said. Because he knew Jesus' voice. 
he heard the voice of his good shepherd. And this once blind man followed because our good shepherd goes out in front of us. He leads us. He doesn't stand behind us yelling, mush! He heard his good shepherd and he followed. And there's a time coming soon in this gospel where we're going to see Jesus lay down his very life for his sheep. And maybe you're here at this church or you're watching online and you're wondering why we at this church listen to him. Do, do you maybe sit here and you're like, he's, a, he's crazy, he's a lunatic, he's raving mad. Are you wondering why we listen to him? If you do, ask somebody their story. Ask somebody how they came to know Jesus. And just listen. Listen through the ums. Listen through the backtracking because they forgot about something that was really important. Listen to their story. And through their story, listen for the voice of your shepherd calling you. Or maybe you've started to recognize that the only one who has the power to heal, to lift, to open the eyes of the blind is the very person of God made flesh. Your gate, your good shepherd, Jesus, the Messiah. We're going to be celebrating a baptism in a few minutes. And as we do, I just want you to ask, do you believe? Remember, this entire gospel was written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and have life in his name. Not a life of drudgery, not a life of complacency, not a life of woe is me. Life to the full. If today is the first day that you, you, you're like, I'm going to do it, I'm going to respond to Jesus, I want you to be encouraged I want you to find somebody, if we have prayer up here after service every week, I want you to find someone up there and pray with them. Let us know. Let the people next to you know, even if you don't know them. Christians are, are weird sometimes, like we're a little socially awkward. So like, if you're like, dude, like, Jesus is my, my, my shepherd now. They'll love that. Let them know. Let someone know. Because your good shepherd knows your name and has laid down his life for yours. And that should be celebrated, not hidden. So I want to close out with a little bit of a different thing. I'm going to ask everybody to just bow your heads and close your eyes. Because what I want to do is I want to read for you the promise that we read in Psalm 23. And I want you to just listen to these words. And I want you to let them aim for your heart as you consider Jesus who is your good shepherd says this in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside quiet waters, he refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Will you dwell with your good shepherd today? Let's pray. Father, thank you that you do not leave us nor forsake us but you are the good shepherd who has laid down your life once and for all it is finished and we can be reconciled to god through you filled with the guarantee of your holy spirit who dwells within us thank you that you are the gate that we enter thank you that you are the one who who gives us protection and care. You're the one who leads us beside still waters. 
Sometimes, Lord, even when we are fighting tooth and nail because we don't want to, because we want to keep climbing a wall. Lord, I just pray for everyone in here that if they don't know you yet, Lord, if they haven't responded to the voice of their shepherd calling them, Lord, I ask that they would in this moment right now, that they would experience the safety and the security and the peace and the comfort that comes from a father who knows their name and knows the number of hairs on their head. God, may you be glorified through these people that we would never grow complacent in the work that you have done, but that we would worship and that we would tell people our stories because our stories is the story of you. Father, help us to honor you, and I pray that we would just follow our shepherd. And it's in the mighty, wonderful, caring, powerful name of Jesus we pray.